My name is Zarino. Um, I work for My Society. Hands up if anybody has ever heard of My Society. They work for you. What do they know? Write to them. Look at all you people, you brilliant, educated, informed people. Such, such excellent quality. Um, so for those that don't know us, uh, My Society is a small charity, and we basically believe that everybody should have access to democracy wherever they are in the world. Um, and that usually means working with international partners um, to deliver sort of civic tech solutions uh, all over the world to let people hold their local decision makers to account. Um, so we've got code uh, running in all of those countries. So Alavitelli, our freedom of information um, code base, is used in about 28 countries. Fix My Street for reporting issues to councils and bodies is used in about 18 countries. Um, and we've got parliamentary monitoring sites running in countries like Zimbabwe, Iran, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, loads of them. Um, so making things for countries and cultures that are very different to your own can often, if you've not done it before, can require quite a change from everyone in your organization. So not just, um, as Lara was saying, UX designers and researchers, but also developers, project managers. But it's something that you can add piece by piece and iteratively improve on. Um, so I want to share some of the ways we've approached this at my society over the last five or six years. Um, and hopefully you guys can think about how it might apply to what you're doing, whether you're designing for people away from home or close to home. So first off, I want to address that word. Um, so despite me using the term developing world, I'm basically using it as a shorthand because there is no term that covers all of this. Um, even in the countries we work with, there is more difference between Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana than there are similarities. So one of the important things for you as designers is to think, um, is, is to understand the actual differences out there in the field and not go for the easy solutions and for the stereotypes. Um, so understanding local culture is a really big part of that. Um, one example that made me laugh was uh, when we were designing a candidate crowdsourcing site for the elections in Costa Rica. Um, and our partner literally said, don't use green. And we're like, yeah, right, whatever. And, and me and Martin, the other designer, sort of used to coloring things in with pencils. We sort of pick whatever color we want, you know. Um, and it turns out that basically they were really worried because the leading incumbent and very unpopular political party in Costa Rica, their color was green. And they were worried if we use green anywhere on the site, people will assume this website is just a mouthpiece for this, for this entrenched government. Um, we had a similar sort of thing with a design agency that we were partnering with in the Dominican Republic. Uh, whenever they were sending wireframes through, and that was a sort of mock up wireframe they sent through, it was packed with text, so much text. And we were like, nobody in the UK, nobody would read that text. It's just getting in the way. It's going to distract them. Um, and they were like, no, 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 hear us out. Basically, this is what all websites look like in the Dominican Republic. Um, and it's partly because the whole nation has sort of got used to corruption and deception in official government processes. And the more that you could um, quash their fears early on and give them as much text as possible up front, uh, the more likely they are to complete the whole journey. Um, this is a, uh, one of our sites that we uh, run in South Africa. This is interesting because it's not just about like behavioral culture, but also historical culture. So this is one of the only sites that we help run that isn't hosted in the UK. This is hosted in South Africa for South African visitors. And part of that reason was it seems silly to us, and it seems like a long time ago, but to a lot of people in South Africa, sort of the history of British colonialism is still very raw. And our partners in South Africa knew that if they were going to make this site a success, they needed to make it clear that it had nothing to do with Britain or the UK or political interference. And that even included like, making sure it wasn't hosted in the UK. So those are a couple of examples of like, understanding local culture. Um, but part of understanding local culture is going where the people are. And sometimes that's like literally. So um, this is an example. Way in the back there are two of my colleagues, um, Paul and Dave, uh, doing some user research literally out on the streets in Liberia, I think, um, which is always really useful. And I don't need to tell you how useful it is, because Lara just gave like a 10-minute talk about how useful this stuff is. Um, but as well, um, reaching out to people can be like figuratively to fit in with the sort of behaviors that they, you know they're already doing. So um, a colleague of mine, Paul, who was in that photo, once said that Facebook is the internet. 
And we, especially the geeky class in the UK, can get quite sniffy about Facebook sometimes and privacy issues and whatever. But over there, um, often in the developing world, Facebook is the way that people access the internet. You've got countries like um, uh, Gambia and uh, Myanmar and Ghana where there's a whole cottage industry of getting people cheap new phones. You go, they set up all the apps you'll want. Obviously, everybody wants Facebook, number one. Um, and they'll set up even a Facebook account for you there and then. And you'll never know the password or the email address that's used for your Facebook account, because it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're logged into Facebook on that device, and that is your window onto the world. And these are the people we realized we were building websites for. So when we'd done a, a user experience uh, research trip, um, out in Uganda uh, to do with anti-corruption in government. We knew that there were websites like ipaidabribe.com, but we knew that our, our research was that people aren't using these websites and people aren't visiting them. So our design prototype was actually a Facebook page and a funny video, and that, <laughs> and that worked. Um, in lots of countries, um, for instance, in Ghana here, uh, Facebook has tie-ins with the local mobile operators to provide free internet access to Facebook. Um, and it was no coincidence that Ghana was one of the first countries where we helped them set up a Fix My Street install, and they were the first to absolutely require fix my, um, Facebook login on Fix My Street, because they were like, people don't have emails, they don't, there's no other way for them to interact with this website. And to us, Facebook login is still a bit of a nice to have. Uh, there, it was absolutely crucial. Um, so speaking of how people access uh, the stuff you make, um, it's really important to think about um, how, uh, what, what software and hardware they're using. So in the UK, we're in the lucky position where the dominance of Chrome and Safari on iOS has sort of made us quite lazy. Um, but in developing countries and elsewhere around the world, browser fragmentation is much more of a problem. Um, so for instance, you end up with stats like that. So two of our biggest sites that we help partners run. 50% uh, of the hits come from Opera Mini, which is like a bizarre, bizarre and that number admittedly has been falling. It used to be about 75% when I first joined, um, and Chrome has slowly been eking up. But still, if you don't do your research and you don't know this, it can really, really knock you for one. So that's a list of only the top quarter of this page of all of the things that Opera Mini does not support. Um, and uh, even things like line height. Nope, can't, can't change the line height. Um, but people use these proxy browsers because they mean that patchy, slow internet access out in the sticks in Kenya can actually be bearable. Um, and so we knew that we need to make sure that our websites, whenever we make a change, we test it in Opera Mini. Speaking of testing, um, I have to give a plug. I'm, I'm sure I'm allowed to do this. I have to give a plug to Browser Stack. It is brilliant. I don't know. Hands up if anybody's using Browser Stack. Yeah, OK. These people know what they're doing. Um, it, it, we used to mess around with VMs. It was just a nightmare. These guys, they, do, they give you free plans as well if you're working on open source stuff. My society is almost entirely open source. Um, so it's just a fantastic way of being able to test quickly and iteratively all the way through. So right at the start, you can even test your wireframes, like if you're designing in the browser, see what's working rather than getting surprised later on. All of this is for nothing if you don't actually make a change, though, and make a start. Um, so the fourth thing I wanted to mention that we try and do a lot at my society is to improve stuff really early on. Um, and if we don't, we try and do like a front-end performance sprint. It's fun, honest. Um, so uh, that's the GitHub ticket that started it all. Um, Pombola is the software that runs a bunch of our African parliamentary monitoring sites. And we were like, we have no idea whether our sites are actually performant or not. We think they are. We've used best practices. We should find out. So basically, the way we did it is get the whole team behind you, set aside a couple of days. We didn't even set aside a whole sprint, and do a performance audit, look at what's working and what's not working, see whether you can get your local partners to try it out on real devices in the real country, and then set goals as to what you want to try and fix. Uh, and then actually iteratively improve it. So, for example, we ended up saving about 40% of the page weight of one of our sites that we thought was OK to begin with. Um, page weight isn't everything, but it was a huge improvement to just literally the first time somebody visited that site, it loaded a lot quicker. Um, so in a few days, you can go, f um, you can spend just a couple of days improving life for thousands of users who are using your site and saving them data and money and time. Um, 
So putting it all together, we had uh, understanding local culture, we had following the users, whether that's figuratively or literally, uh, designing for multiple devices, um, and, and trying it out now, iteratively, making a change now. Um, so I called it design for the developing world. It's actually really designed for the whole world, because this is stuff you should all already know, and you can all already try out. So my question to you guys is going to be, what are you going to try and improve first? And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Awesome. Excellent work. Thank you. <laughs> well, let, let's start with that. What are you going to improve first? <laughs> anybody, anybody been inspired straight off the bat? Yes. Just, just generally inspired. OK, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, I'm, I'm dying to ask you a couple of, yeah. I guess, policy things. Because oh, yeah. you, know, you have quite a unique understanding of, of working in some of these countries. Yeah. Um, so if you can think of some maybe some more technical questions to throw in as well, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, but I'm going to ask you this because it's been debated hotly over recent weeks, um, and probably by all the wrong people, but I suspect <laughs> you're the right person. Yeah. Um, what is it that Facebook should be doing going forwards? How should they be, mm -hmm. if, if they are the internet experience for most people, um, how should they be evolving? Um, so I have to say there is an excellent um, civic, what we do at my site is called civic technology, and there is an absolutely excellent civic technology team in Facebook. Facebook is a, a huge monster, and there are some really interesting teams in there. And we've been at my society in touch quite a lot with Facebook and the civic tech team um, there. And they are doing stuff. I don't know whether anybody during the, the last election in the UK noticed that they'll tell you there's an election coming up. We're all used to that. But then for a lot of people, they were able to tell you uh, who's standing and who won the day after the election. Um, I don't know whether anybody saw that. I did. Um, that was partly because of work we'd done with, with Facebook. So trying to help crowdsource candidate information um, so that they could, on the day that the winner was there, they could show you who your MP was, your new MP. Here's their Facebook page. You can follow them. Um, and it turns out we, we were thinking, oh, yeah, it's just, it's just to build a few more links in Facebook's network. Does it really matter? It turns out actually lots of people did end up following their new MP, either because they support their MP, and they're like, yeah, my guy won. I want to follow them and, and, and help them out and be their friend, or because the person they didn't want to win came in, and they're like, I want to I wanna keep an eye on this guy and make sure he's doing what he's doing. Okay, either way, that's great. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Either way, that's great. Yeah. The fact that these are people who might never have used any of my society's sites or any other similar sort of tech sites, yeah. bringing it to them a little bit might then sort of lead them to getting more involved in other bits of civic participation. So, yeah. Yeah. so Facebook has an active role in holding I, these I, places to account, I these think governments so. to account. You, you, you can't just ignore it, um, and they are, Facebook is trying to get involved with it. They're, they're starting to realize now, especially with news in the last couple of, like, six months, 12 months, that they've got a role to play in this. Great, thank you. And, and us too, by the sounds of it, the work yeah. that you're doing is influencing that. Yeah. So yeah. that's fantastic. Um, are most of your clients... Um, in-country companies? Is that, is that who you work for? Or do you work for governments or <laughs> NGOs? Or? Um, it's a total mix. Okay. Um, but most of the sites that I was talking about there are sites where we've helped local partners who are like usually journalistic like media organizations, or they might be just like local activist groups, or there'll be groups that are interested in how democracy is working in their country. Um, often they're completely non-profit, and, and we have like it's an unusual sort of symbiotic relationship where we help them run the site, we add improved like, features when they ask for it, and we sort of together try and build, build the site. Yeah. And, yeah. Can you tell, um, and maybe I'm shooting in the dark here, but can you tell when the organization that you're working with is feeling the pressure from another party in country? Like they're, they're being watched or they're being policed or they're, they're, yes. there's a party line? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not always, but yeah, one of... Um, there was a site we made, I was just talking about it last night with the other speakers uh, in Iran, um, where we have a service in the UK called Write to Them, which lets you put in your postcode and you can write to all your local councillors and MPs. Um, and there's something similar, a similar sort of piece of software that we're trying to develop that's a bit easier for people to set up in these countries. And one of the, there, was, there was this activist group in Iran who were like, we need, we need to provide this so that people can start asking, asking their reps, like, what are they doing about these problems and not being ignored? And a big part of that was making sure that it was anonymous, making sure that there were no logs kept and no records, because we were really worried, as you say, that 
the government is often our, ours is like a friendly bear, basically. Like they've, the <laughs> Parliament has got used to my friendly making bear, making trouble for, for for Parliament. But in other countries, it, it is still like some of this stuff is really cutting edge, and there are people who are literally fearing for their lives yeah. by asking these questions or requesting these freedom of information questions. Um, so we try and do whatever we can to help them and support them. And, and the more we do, we're trying to build a, a community of these sorts of activists that can share the things they've learned. Yeah. Um, because it would be a shame for everybody to have to learn the same yeah. things again yeah. and again. Fascinating. Thank you. And a whole extra dimension to, to testing and design yeah, that we, yeah. we hardly have to consider. Um, questions for Zarino, please. This is, I mean, this is an opportunity to ask something. Yes. I mean, most of the stuff we do, we're able to use like the emulators in Chrome uh, to be able to get the network throttling and CPU throttling and stuff for free. That's worth looking into. I don't know what the, your device is like. Um, one of the things that has been really useful, especially when we've been working with councils in the UK, for instance, um, we provide software for them to go and fix problems in the road and inspect things. And actually seeing their device and knowing the, like the specs and like being there and getting first-hand feedback from the inspectors as they're going out there is so invaluable. Because you spot all the things, they're like, oh my god, I never thought you would, you would go there to do that on this screen. It turns out you can't see the screen because the sunlight is reflecting off it and stuff. That's not quite exactly the same as yours, but the, the idea of going out there first-hand, if you can, and like using the actual device, there's still no replacement for that. But other than that, looking at the network timeline in, in your browser and seeing, seeing like what the JavaScript profiling is of like how long is it taking to render and run and things like that might help. Um, there's so much I, had, I, I, should have, I should publish a blog post with like all, the, all like the, the sort of links to this sort of stuff. There's yes, loads out there. A few people nodding. Yes, good. Blog post, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, there's a few technical hints there, but get on the plane if you can. <laughs> Good, thank you. Zarino is here all day. Um, please do go up to him and ask him more questions. Um, thank you very much. Another round of applause, please.